You're in for a treat with this episode today. From Homeless to Hero with an ACE score of 10, Michael Unbroken, as he goes by all of our social media, he found his way from stuck, hurt, and broken to being the hero of his own journey. Today, Michael has coached thousands of trauma warriors around the world to learn to love themselves, get unstuck, and be unbroken. We, we talk a little bit about some of his traumas in the past, being homeless, and how he's overcoming, overcome some of those, and uh, from not being able to graduate high school, uh, to getting his diploma, to earning his first six figures, to putting on you know 200 pounds and losing the weight. It was really a fantastic conversation. Michael is the author of the best-selling book, Think Unbroken, and is a coach, mentor, and educator of adult survivors of child abuse. Michael spends his time helping other survivors get out of what he calls the vortex to become the hero of their journey. Michael hosts the Think Unbroken podcast, which teaches, he also teaches at the Think Unbroken Academy and is on a mission to end generational trauma in his lifetime through education and information. He also offers a special invitation, if you're listening to this in the first week of December, to join him for his Unbroken Conference. Uh, And he'll give the link at the end of the episode for you to join him and other speakers for this event. Uh, Get ready to learn about the parasympathetic nervous system, emotional response, meaning making, what to say yes and no to, how to gain clarity, uh, how to trust yourself. Really fantastic episode with Michael Unbroken. So welcome back to the Better Than Rich show. I'm your host today, Mike Abramowitz, and I am here with Michael Unbroken. And uh, I'm really excited for this conversation. If you don't know who he is, you're about to uh, learn why we have him on the show. Uh, So Mike, welcome to the show, brother. Yeah, dude. Uh, Thanks for being here, man. It's an honor. I'm excited to chat with you. Yeah. Well, I know you have an awesome platform. You have the the Think Unbroken podcast. You have the Think Unbroken Academy. Um, You have a great presence on social media. A lot of people know about you. You have over 1,500 people coming to your next upcoming event. Uh, But our audience, maybe they know you, maybe they don't. What what would you say to, um, what would be important for them to know about you as a human and, um, you know, why you do what you do? Yeah, man. You know, ultimately, I think it's like you look at the way that life unfolds in front of you, right? There are all these different things that happen and intermingle and kind of create the the DNA helix of our experience, if you will. And every so often in that, you'll find this thing that you like latch on to, right? And that thing that you latch on to can either create your life or destroy your life. And that very thing that I latched onto then is kind of the thing I latch onto now, but differently. And so I suffered just the most massive and horrific childhood trauma. And through that, what happened is I I hit a lot of rock bottoms, Mike, a lot. I really upended and destroyed my life. I know we'll get into it a bit more. And that was the very thing that now has empowered me to help hundreds of thousands of people around the world, to have a best-selling book, to have written a few books now, to have coached thousands of people, to have all these folks who trust and believe in being unbroken. And it, honestly, man, at the end of the day, it just what it comes down to is, you know, it's like what Tony teaches, right? Tony Robbins, you have your UPW shirt on. Right. And, and years and years ago, I was in a private session with him, semi-private, you know, it's 80 people or whatever. And, and this was the first time this really sat with me. And he was like, life is happening for you, not to you. And I'd heard that, you know, always heard that. And I was like, oh, I get it now. What are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with the trauma, the abuse, the pain, the suffering, the hurt, the guilt, the shame, everything that comes along with growing up in the way that I grew up? And, and ultimately it was like, yeah, what am I going to do with this? Now, there were a lot of moments like leading up to that where I'd actually started the work and been doing some other things. Um, and that wasn't like the singular moment, right? I won't pin it to that. But what I am saying is that in this experience, there are those things that we can choose to hold on to to better our life or to use as a reason and excuse, which is entirely valid. So let's be clear about that to destroy our life. And after I got done destroying my life, I decided to better it. At what at what part in life? And by the way, thanks for sharing, man. Going going right right to it. So, at what part in life uh, are you suggesting to some of your your tribe, the trauma warriors, uh, that they can make the transition? Is it an age? Is it a 
you know, once they enter a relationship, is it, uh, you know, is it a certain chapter of life? Is it whenever they make the decision? Like, is there a point in time uh, that people that you're suggesting these people to hit a breaking point and then they, that's the only way for you to kind of move to the other side or uh, can they impose this own deadline on themselves? Like, what, what do you suggest for, for some of your following there? You know, I, w- I would hope that now with what we've done in creating thousands of hours of content, more courses than I can count, the books, me being a guest and, and teaching this stuff that we could mitigate the possibility of the rock bottom. But Mike, dude, you know this as well as I do. Change only happens when you make change happen, man. And, and my, my hope is that we can give people the tools to circumvent that, but, but ultimately, and I see it all the time, and I've worked with some of the greatest minds in trauma on planet earth from Pete Walker to Dr. Gabor Mate, Caroline Leaf, Anna Lamke. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. All these people I've talked with interviewed and and everybody's kind of like the rock bottom's kind of going to happen, right? Because that's that place of when you're like, okay, now I actually need to do something with my life. Mm. And and I don't think it's about an age. Dude, I've, I've coached people as young as 18 years old to I think my oldest client ever, she was a 66-year-old over-the-road truck driver, mm. right? I've coached corporate executives. I've coached just, you know, people in their day-to-day lives who just do mom and pop things, whatever. You know, it's here's what's fascinating. When, when I got deep into this, at the beginning, like my intention was not anything that I've created today, right? My intention was very simple. I was like, oh, I'm going to get my own shit together. That's it. I'm going to get my shit together. I'm going to stop getting in my own way. I'm going to stop destroying my life, relationships, finances, health. I mean, at, at 26, dude, I was 350 pounds. I was smoking mm-hmm. two packs a day, drinking myself to sleep. And, and the thing that you come that I came to realize is, like, oh, wait, wait, this is my doing. This is mm-hmm. my fault. That's not being culpable for the bad things that happened to us, right? I, I don't want people to take it that way. It's not your fault if you had abusive parents. It's not your fault if you suffered massive trauma. But at some point, you do have to look in the mirror and be like, wait a second, what actions am I taking in my life that have led me to this place? Because there is some space where this is on you, right? That's a really hard pill for people to swallow. And so you can't really look at it from age or relationship or status or any of that. It's when you come to terms with the truth. You look Mm. in the mirror, you do what I did when I was 25 heading into 26, you go, what am I willing to do to have the life that I want to have, right? And if you are willing to sit in that, that's where your life changes. Mm. And, and in this chapter of life at 25, 26, is this that homeless period that um, that we alluded to in the bio? Or is this uh, around the similar time or? No. So, you know, a little, little context and backstory. So, you know, growing up, I grew up in Indiana. My mom was a drug addict and alcoholic. Um, in fact, when I was only four years old, she actually cut off my right index finger. Right. And mm. so hurt people, hurt people. I always want to context that she suffered a massive amount of trauma and abuse. So did her mother and her mother before her. That's this generational thing. She married my stepfather when I was six and he was massively abusive, dude. So Mike, I'm, I'm six foot three, almost six foot four, 220 pounds. I'm a freaking linebacker. Right. So um, imagine a guy my size beating up a seven year old. Right. And so they were hyper volatile, volatile into drugs and alcohol. And we live with over 30 different families between the time I was eight to 12 years old. So, I mean, that period of time we were getting bounced around, living in strangers' houses, vans, churches, my grandma's house, my aunt's house, my sister's house. Like, it was crazy all over the place and really never having a stable home. And then when I was 12, my grandmother actually adopted me, right? And you think that'd be a godsend. And to some extent it was, but I'm biracial, black and white, and she was an old racist white lady (laughs) from a town in Tennessee you never heard of. Right. Mm -hmm. So insert identity crisis. And and that was kind of childhood. Right. And all those things, they let up, let up, let up and puts me in this position where at 26 and now I'm in this rock bottom. Right. That's where I I just hit the the wall the thousandth time. Another destroyed relationship. My health is incredibly poor. I'm, I'm working at a Fortune 10 company, which is like seemingly impossible for someone from where I'm from 
no high school diploma, no college education. Like I'm sitting here, I'm making six figures and I'm 50 grand in debt, right? Mm. Like it, it was chaos. And so that, that transition period, what happened is, you know, I was just done. I was just tired of myself. And I knew that somewhere in there, there had to be more because as a little kid, I promised myself there would be more. Right. And so many of us as children, we make these promises. We say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create this life. I'm going to chase this dream. I'm going to create this thing. And then what happens is life. And then we see the impact. And then we see all the people telling us what we can or can't do. And we, we suffer so much before we don't. And, mm-hmm. and that's kind of what happened in that window. And and I'd like to go to that that chapter. And by the way, thanks for sharing, Mike. I, 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 I'm, sure. I'm really excited to um, introduce some of this to our audience. Cause we, we've had a couple of individuals talk about some of the deep trauma work, specifically Dr. Kelly Flanagan, for those of you listening right now, that's a really great episode, uh, to, to kind of explore the false self and, and navigate through some of those internal beliefs and some of the trauma behind it. Uh, I'd like to, you know, get your lens on some of this. So when you, you reach this place, it's in school, you say high school is not for me. And then sometime within a decade period, you accumulate $50,000 in debt while simultaneously accumulating $100,000 a year. Can you kind of speak to just some of the decision making that was happening just kind of like during that time period? Because I asked this because oftentimes the decisions that we're making at that chapter of life, we pay the consequences of some of those decisions, whether it's positive never or negative later on in life. But some of those decisions that were probably foundational for some of the decisions you're making today, I'm assuming there's some lessons that showed up from those decisions. So I'm curious on number one, what were some of those decisions? And then number two, what were the either the negative or positive or lessons or consequences that came later on in life down the road, specifically around deciding to leave school and deciding, you know, how you got this six figure opportunity and how you accumulated $50,000 in debt, you know, just some of those decisions that led, you know, toward, you know, through that path. Yeah, man. I, so I didn't decide to leave school. I just didn't care enough to ever like put any effort in. Right. So when I I've, I've posted my report card on social before, like I graduated high school because they literally gave me the diploma. <laughs> I remember. So I, I, I the irony is my senior year, my business teacher fails me, right? Irony of all ironies. And I go up to their classroom. My girlfriend calls me. I'm at home. I'm stoned. I'm playing video games. And she's like, oh, by the way, you're not graduating high school. And I was like, oh, what? Right? And, and Mike, I'll be honest with you. I knew why. I never went. I never did anything. I had straight D's and F's. And I, I go to Mr. Bush. Northwest High School, second floor, corner of the building. And I walk up to him, end of a period. And I go, how dare you fail me? And he says, I didn't fail you. You failed yourself. And he followed that by the literally to this day, the most important thing anyone has ever told me in my life. He says, you know, if you want to get by in life, you have to earn it. You can't just get off on your charms and your good looks. And I had to go to summer school man. And that was incredibly embarrassing. My girlfriend was embarrassed of me. My family's embarrassed me. I was embarrassed of me. Mm. And I'm in summer school and the teacher comes up to me. We're like three weeks in. I had just gotten fired from this warehouse job, putting microchips into motherboards all day long. It was like anyone could do it, but I'm sitting here watching the despair and desperation in people's eyes because dude, that assembly line was going to be the best it would ever be for some of those people right? And I get fired from this job where all you had to do was show up. And I'm sitting here in this classroom. I just got fired. My life is in chaos. My grandmother's in a coma. I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. And he comes up to me and the teacher comes up to me. He's like, dude, we're done with you. We're giving you a diploma. Get out. Cause I'm just making trouble and I'm flirting with girls and I'm super high walking into class. And so now I'm sitting in my car after this moment and I'm thinking to myself, okay, hold on. What is, what is really happening here? Like what's really going on? And I started thinking about it. Like what is the solution for poverty, for homelessness, for abuse? What is the solution for all these just horrendous things I've suffered for 18 years? And Mike, I was like, it's money. 
right? Like what else would it be? That's the one thing our family is always talking about. That's the one thing we never have. That's the one thing when the phone rings and the collectors are on the line and they're putting the eviction notices on the door and the cars get repoed out of the front yard and we're stilling food to survive and the water's turned off. It's money, right? And so I said, I'm going to make $100,000 a year legally. Now, look, man, the, the legal part is very important in this because, because I know I'm being serious because I had spent a lot of times making money illegally and I was really good at it. And we were stealing cars and breaking into houses and selling drugs. And, you know, I have family to this day in prison for life, right? My uncle has been in prison over 40 years, dude right? I've been in handcuffs more times than I can count. And my three childhood best friends have been murdered. I knew what was going to happen if I didn't change this, right? And so that legal thing gave me clarity. So this is decision number one. I'm answering your question, but I want to create massive context for this. Clarity is the most important thing that we can have in a decision-making process. Now, having clarity also means that you have the full scope of clarity. For me at 18 years old, my clarity was 100 grand a year legally. And so I just started working and I landed a job at 18 and a half with a fast food joint. I got 52 people under me in a leadership role doing a million dollars a year in cheeseburgers and fries, dude. Like it was crazy. And of course at 18, I made every leadership mistake you could ever possibly imagine, but I'm still not getting me to the goal, right? I was making like 35 grand or something. And I just started applying for job after job after job after job. And for a year and a half, 18 months, I got told no hundreds of times until somebody told me yes. And I landed a job with one of the biggest insurance companies in the entire country, one that probably everybody who's listening to this has heard of. I came in as an assistant in a sales department. That turned into having a full-time sales gig. And around my 21st birthday, I cashed my first check for $10,000, right? Hmm. And, and that led me down this path because what started to happen is I was like, oh, I'm good at sales. I can give people the thing that they need to, to protect them and change their life. And so, you know, I'm writing five to $7 million a year in insurance policy. I got this big book of business. I'm making all this money. Next thing you know, you fast forward to 26. Here I am. I've made a million dollars almost, Mike. And I'm 50 grand in debt living paycheck to paycheck, Right. Because of the decisions I was making, I lived above a bar where I had like a $2,000 a month tab always, right? Went out to restaurants constantly, clothes full, closet full of clothes, $85,000 a car, terrible smoking habit. You know how much two packs a day costs? It's crazy. I was eating McDonald's 20 times a week, not to mention all the other fast food, right? I had a massive collection of nonsense in my home, just burning through money because I thought that it would make me feel good about who I was. And then I realized it doesn't. And that was, mm. that was the journey, man. Just going like, wait a second, that money doesn't matter. And, and that's one of the things that's helped me be successful now, running multiple companies, having my production company, Pods of Purpose, having Think Unbroken, where we coach people, having my retail company, is that I, I stopped making it about money and I started making it about service and value for people. And, and I'll tell you this, the, the decisions that I make now are around the clarity of what I look at 10 years and 20 years down the road. You know, I think so many people think so short sighted, which is reasonable because like for me growing up in trauma, we never knew when we were going to have money again. And so I was like, I'm just going to spend it now. Right. I'm just going to get rid of it. I'm going to buy whatever I want. And, and it's not that I don't do that still, but it's different. Because now I look at my life and the investments that I make are in personal development, are in coaching, are in my own businesses. You know, I've, I've made tremendous investments to put together big events, tremendous investments in my own personal healing and growth, right? And, and I think that's the difference because at 26 years old, after this rock bottom moment, you know, one day I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm looking down at my shoes, Mike, and, and I realized, man, 
these Jordans that I have on right now that were $300 cost more money than I've ever invested in myself. And I realized, I was like, man, you love these shoes more than you love you. And that became a turning point for me. And then it became like a Brendan Burchard course. And then it came a Tony Robbins course. And then it became this and this and this and this. And the list just spirals and go down because the clarity and decision-making I have now is about the life that I want to have in the future, not the life that I want to have right now in this moment, if that makes mm. sense. Makes a lot of sense. And I think from from what you're sharing is when you start making those decisions, you start gaining trust in yourself uh, because this, you start stacking. You start stacking, okay, I'm going to buy these shoes, but now, in, now instead of the shoes, we're in addition to shoes, I'm also going to spend the same amount of money on some personal growth. I'm going to read a book instead of watching TV. I'm going to go to the gym instead of smoking and smoking the cigarettes. I'm going to train water for the, you know, the alcohol and so the alcohol, drink the water. And like you start, I'm assuming start making different decisions and those little decisions create a uh, trust. I'm assuming. Um, and when you establish that trust with yourself, that's like, I can count on me that I'm actually going to make good decisions. Uh, I don't, I don't want to assume this, but can you speak to like the stacking of some of those new decisions that you've made uh, yeah. you know, by investing in yourself. Yeah. I'm, look, I'm really glad that you asked that question because that's the right question. Mike, look, here, here's the reality. One of the things that people really need to understand about growing up in a traumatic background and, and that could be massive trauma, like what I went through. And it can also be minor trauma where it's like this one little thing that really lays out a framework and a path of belief or lack thereof in yourself is that, and I've talked to people about this a lot over the years, like trauma to me, and this is my interpretation after doing this for a long time, it's not the finger that my mom cut off. It's not the scars. It's not the burns. It's none of that stuff that I carry. It's the theft of identity, right? And so what happens is when you go through a traumatic household or traumatic childhood, you learn to not be you. Because being you is safe, okay? It's safe to not have an opinion. It's safe to be small. It's safe to be hidden, right? And that's an autonomic response to the stressors of the environment that you're in. Well, think about this, Mike. And this is what's crazy, dude. That serves you for a period of time. To be a chameleon, to be hidden, to be ostracized from reality, that keeps you safe. It keeps you protected, right? But what do you do when you're 20, 27, 35, 52, 66 years old, right? You don't know how to be you. You don't know how to say yes. You don't know how to say no. You don't know your wants, your needs, your interests, your boundaries, your values, your morals, your integrity, right? Because you've never been allotted the space to be who you are. And so when I started stacking those decisions, that built confidence over time, what happened was at the beginning, I felt like an imposter. And this is where people quit. They go, man, I don't feel like it's really me. And so I am uncomfortable. I'm going to stop doing this and I'm going to go back to the person I used to be. Because the person you used to be is safe. It's known. You've been that person before. And so when I was going through this, I tell people all the time, 26 to 30 were the hardest four years of my life, man, without question, because it was like one step forward and a freaking million steps backwards, dude. It was like, damn, I did the thing again. I said, I'd never do. Right. And, and that's because there's this iteration that has to happen, right? There is this assimilation that has to happen in which you become who you are. And the becoming who you are takes time. And so I was taking these different choices and decisions. I was putting them together day after day after day after day, building and replacing old habits with new habits, new behavioral patterns, new thought processes. And, and if right? you could get and, into some of the specifics please. there, like during that time frame, 26 to 30, because, you know, you think about what what are some of those bad or those mistakes or those choices that you're like, dang, those were choices. Those were mistakes that I made. I learned a lot from them, but I, these are some of the, so maybe some, maybe a listener here in this, yeah. they're like, mm, maybe I could avoid some of these, or I could take, they take the wisdom from what Michael's sharing with us. 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, I, I think it's about the way I'll, I'll summarize it simply. I believe and this is my truth and maybe you don't. I believe we all know the thing we should be doing, right? We know what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat to an extent, right? I mean, there's obviously the education, but you kind of get the gist. And the thing that I made the decision around doing was doing the things I knew I should be or not be doing, right? So not smoking, drinking, getting high all day long, not eating McDonald's 20 times a week, right? And so what would happen is, man, I'd make it six hours, not smoke a cigarette. I'd make it a day, not have a drink. I'd make it three days and not have fast food, right? And then I'd revert to the old behavior because I was triggered because something happened because I didn't have the ability to be in my parasympathetic nervous system. And because I was hyper aroused and in this fight or flight state, I always went to the things that soothed me. So as I got more educated, as I understood really the biological experience that we're having as human beings, I was able in those moments in when it, which it was easy to satiate with something that hurt to s remind myself, like, and sometimes Mike, it'd be in the moment, dude, I get mad at myself. I would go buy a pack of, here, here, real life example, man. I'd go buy a damn pack of cigarettes. I'd smoke half of one and I'd throw the whole pack away. Right. And that's eight bucks a pop or whatever they used to cost back then. And then I'd make it a day and I would do it again. And then I'd make it two days and I'd do it again. But then what happened is that two days turned into four, into eight, into 16, into 32, right? And then turned into a decade later. And, mm -hmm. and that applied to a lot of the things in life, like going to the gym and losing all the weight. I was 350 pounds. Like you don't get there by accident. And for me, and I'll speak for myself, that ain't my DNA, right? People will be like, oh yeah, I'm big bone. Like, no, you're not. We all have pretty much the same bone structure. <laughs> and so for me, the thing that happened was I realized every time that I put poison into my body, I'm hurting myself in the way that they used to hurt me, but in a different parameter, a different aspect, right? I was creating suffering in myself because here's the truth, man. I, I realized I would, I'd been gluten intolerant since I was a kid. Like every time I ate pizza, I felt sick. Right. And at now almost 13, 12, 13 years ago was the last time I had wheat, right. I had any gluten because I, and this was before, like you could have like almond flour and all that stuff. I was mm -hmm. just like not eating bread and it was miserable. And, but I realized like, mm -hmm. man, every time, even though this makes me sick, I'm doing it. Even though this crippling pain comes, I'm doing it. Right. And for some people that's the beer or the milkshake or the Snickers bar at two in the afternoon, like whatever it is. And then I, I realized like, wait a second, it's okay to love yourself by not giving yourself things that hurt you. And that's really the summary of all this, Mike. It was like, mm. can I give myself something that doesn't take away? And that's a hard thing to come to pass if you've never been given the space to know that it's okay to love yourself. Mm. And it, what's profound about what you're saying is that you're saying yes to loving yourself. You're not saying no to the cigarettes. You're saying yes to loving myself. You're not saying no to the alcohol. So you're saying yes to the things that are going to nourish me. And I think that's what oftentimes happens with people is that if they're quitting something, they're stopping something versus framing it in a way of I'm starting something new. I'm replacing it with something else. And I really love the way you just said that is I'm saying yes mm -hmm. to the things I, that that's fuel me up saying yes to loving myself. Yeah. And Mike, let me add to that, please, because I think this is really important. That applies to relationships. It applies to your career. It applies to your family, your friends, and to everything you do every single day. There are so many people who are trapped in things that are only ever taking from them because they feel like they're somehow obligated. And sometimes that same obligation that you feel that is taking away from you is a form of self-punishment, mm. right? We, we tell ourselves, no, no, it's okay if my partner hits me. It's okay if my boss yells at me. It's okay if my, my mom steals all my stuff, right? We go, no, no, it's okay. That, that's just who they are. Or, or even worse, that's what I deserve. 
and you only will ever get what you allow yourself to deserve. And, and you deserve love and compassion. You know, when I was, when I was 14, I put a restraining order on my mother, right? And my stepfather. Imagine that a 14 year old, a a decision like that. And at 18, I told my mother, I will never talk to her again, right? She had chosen drugs. She had chosen alcohol over me and my siblings too many times. And at 18, I made the hardest to this day, Mike, the hardest decision I've ever made. But dude, I promise you, I promise you, I would not be here had I not made that decision. And that was a decision about loving me, not letting her take away from me. Hmm. And that's a thing that's really hard for people to understand because sometimes the very thing keeping you from being able to love, to have love, to have success, to have whatever is the next level in your life is actually the people in your life. What's challenging is, is, and I'd like to hear your, your opinion on this, is sometimes we have people in our lives that are not uh, willing to change or they're not willing to adapt. So, um, and I'm assuming that was the case with mom too. It's like, how do you, how do you create boundaries or how might you advise someone to create boundaries for themselves to say, you know, if someone crosses this boundary, you don't have to accept that because you deserve more. And if they do, you know, if they cross the boundary, like number one, what are the boundaries that you have for yourself? Like, is it, if they say something to me or if they try to force me to do something or, you know, I just think about, you know, parents often have kids and they don't, they know how to have kids, but they don't know necessarily how to be parents. And we take on a lot of this trauma. Uh, Same thing with bullies, you know, kids getting bullied, like, you know, they're projecting their, their own insecurities onto another person, but you know, how do you explain that to a 14 year old or a 13 year old? So, so what, what, what is your, what is your counsel that you would offer to someone around creating boundaries about what you're willing to tolerate, what you're willing to accept, what you feel like you should deserve is on this side of the boundary. And if someone crosses it, how do you either address it, retreat from it, you know, uh, whatever it might be, what, what would you say to that? Yeah. You know, when when I was young, those decisions that I made were because, like, honestly, I felt like my back was against the wall, right? And I felt like if I didn't do that, I I, I just felt like my life was going to be over. And that's a really different experience for a lot of people, especially I assume if they're listening to this. And and I think the thing people must remember is that boundaries are actually for you. They're not for them. Boundaries are for you as a mechanism to keep yourself protected or safe or sane, right? And, you know, you think about how often people be like, you crossed my boundary. I'm like, yeah, but did you let them? Because at some point you have to recognize you're playing a role in it as well. Again, this is really, it's not about culpability. It's not about pushing people down. It's about awareness, Mike. Can you pay attention to what is happening in your life? Because sometimes what's happening is you you may even, and this happens, I, I counsel people on this all the time when I'm coaching them. They're like, yeah, my this person is crossing this boundary in my life every single day and it's pissing me off and it's making me want to like freak out at them. I'm like, yeah, did you tell them what the boundary <laughs> was? Mm. Did you talk about it? Did you communicate and, and look, I, everybody goes to this. I've definitely had my moments of not communicating well. I've definitely had moments of crossing boundaries. Like it goes both ways. Like let's not get it twisted. And, and I think the biggest thing that you can do, especially up front is like, the, this is what is okay. And what is not okay. I'll, I'll give you an mm-hmm. example. In re- my relationship, I have a very simple boundary and actually this isn't just relationship. This is anything. You're not allowed to yell at me. That's hard and fast. I spent my entire childhood being screamed at by people. And so you are not allowed to yell at me. The first time you do it will be the only time that you do it. And when that happens, I will sit down like a calm in my calm state. And I will be like, Hey, don't yell at me. We're adults. Talk to me like an adult. Talk to me like a human being. I won't. And if you cannot honor that, you yell at me again, Mike, that is my boundary. That is my thing that keeps me safe, that keeps me in my parasympathetic, that keeps me grounded and not out in la-la land. And so if you cross that boundary and I tell you and you do it again, it is now my decision to to decide, right? It is my choice to decide, am I going to allow you to do that again or am I removing myself? 
And and that's the thing. You have to get clear about what it means to you because sometimes yeah, what are you willing to tolerate? Know. You know, because some you some people <laughs> you're about to say the same thing. Some people don't know what they're willing to tolerate. And that's what I was getting into right there. That's exactly correct. You may not know that a boundary has been crossed until the boundary has been crossed. You may not have even known it was ever there. And so when you discover it and you're like, oh, wait a second, that's a boundary. That felt gross. It felt incongruent. It didn't feel like it fit who I am. You've got to pause, step back, and you have to address it, right? And and a lot of times, and, and this is what holds true for me, man, I just grab my notebook. I grab my journal. I'll even grab my phone, and I'll just write. And it will make meaning and make sense of like what is going on and why I feel a certain way. Because processing is such an important part of this journey, right? We all know about the primary function of the brain is survival. But the thing people don't talk about enough is that really function 1A is meaning making. And so you've got to be under, able to understand why that person might have crossed your boundary and why that impacted you so much. Because you may find that as you're in it, in a moment, there's these visceral reactions we have, right? We go, ah, oh, man, screw that guy. They cut me off in the road, blah, 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 whatever. And you go, wait, does it actually even matter? Am I controlling my state? Am I controlling my emotional response to these things, right? And sometimes it's a really really deep cut and you go man that hurt a lot that made me feel sad hurt abandoned lost and then you have to ask yourself why because here's what happens man nobody's a mind reader mike i if, mm. if i cross your boundaries bro like i need to understand what like how and why right? What did it mean? How did it hurt you? How did it impact you? How did it affect you? What was it that I did? How could I have? And then on the backside of it, be able to go like, okay, cool. What's the resolution here? How do I, how do, I do this better? How do I be better at making sure that I, I show up for you and for me? And I think that that really comes, again, we'll come back to that word again, in clarity. Because if you can sit down, Mike, and you go, hey, man, I was really upset with you because you were four hours late to the birthday party, and it made me feel like you don't care about me, and we put all this effort and energy to come together as a group and blah, 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 right? Then I can go, oh, man, that makes a lot of sense. Time matters to Mike. It's important to him. He put in effort and energy. He wants the people in his life to know that when they say yes and they commit to something, they're going to show up because that matters. And look, Mike, here's where it gets really deep, man. That commitment could matter because it may actually be that thing that triggers the reaction that you have to being seven years old and your dad never showing up on time for the baseball game. Mm. Right. And so that's why clarity and asking yourself why is so important because there's causation and correlation to everything. And that if you know that something's important and matters to you and that boundary has been crossed, you can articulate that to the other person. That gives them the space to have a full meaning and understanding. Now, here's where it's really interesting. If they do it again, then you have to ask, do they actually care? Hmm. Yeah, especially, I mean, what you just said, that that whole clip, listener, you, you might want to go back and listen to that because uh, I really like that segment of, of when you said meaning making, uh, essentially meaning making is what's creating the empathy. And by you going through and journaling and, and taking that time with yourself to be curious, I think too many people, um, they're so, uh, so much in reaction mode that they're not proactively willing to <laughs> explore with curiosity. And for you to explore what is the emotional response? What, how can I get clear of what matters most? Um, how can I make meaning out of this? How can I be a little bit more empathetic to the other, the other person or um, just more curious? I, I really, really like that. I wanted to ask you, I wanted to double click on one thing because you mentioned the parasympathetic uh, nervous system uh, twice. I asked this to Ben Pakulski in his episode, uh, former Mr. Canada, and he gave some really good tools. I'd like to hear about some of your tools as well uh, on what you do to activate the parasympathetic nervous system that might be able to help some individuals if they do want to enter in more of that, um, you know, calm energy or getting some of that clarity, what they could do with their body or what you like to teach some people to do with their body. Yeah. 
Um, let's first define it because I know that some people may not know. So in your nervous system, obviously we have tons and hundreds and thousands of nerves and all the things running through our body, including our vagus nerve, which is the biggest nerve in our body that basically runs the entirety of our skeletal system, more or less, right? Especially the upper torso. And so you have these things that happen in the brain that can trigger your nervous system into a response, right? Now you have the parasympathetic nervous system, which I always try to teach people and remind them to think of a parachute, right? Because a parachute will what? Mike, it will save you, right? And, And so... And so a parasympathetic nervous system that's rest, digest, recover, that is a calm state. That's hopefully where you're at right now, right? In this calm, relaxed state. The sympathetic nervous system is your fight, flight, freeze, fawn. That's your activated system. That's your safety. That's your alarm, basically, right? And it's the same system that's activated when you're scared or you're excited, right? It's the same reason why sometimes people will pee their pants if they get scared, because all of your non most important functioning systems, they effectively shut down, right? So that your blood goes to your extremities, your arms and your legs. So if you have to, you can run or battle for your life, right? And so that's the sympathetic nervous system. Obviously, we're going to try to aim to be in the parasympathetic nervous system. But I want to say this. A lot of people give the sympathetic nervous system like a really bad shot. Like they give it a bad name. They're always dumping dirt on it, but you have to have it. You would never survive without it, right? It's a massively important system. So you don't want to be avoidant of it, but you do want to be, again, aware and cognizant of it. So how do I get in the parasympathetic? You know, for, for me, one of the things that I realized having an ACE score 10. So if you don't know the adverse childhood experiences, I highly recommend you look up Dr. Folletti's work um, from Kaiser Permanente and the California Center for Disease Control from a, a, a bit ago, because it'll give you a lot of information that will really profoundly change your life, information we don't have enough time to go. I've talked about it on the podcast. Just if you look up Think Unbroken Podcast, type in ACE score, A-C-E score. I went into a whole diatribe about it. And so because my score was so high and I was on hyper aware, hyper vigilant and hyper independent state constantly, the first thing that I had to do was educate myself. I really think that's foundationally more important. I don't want to say more important massively important, right? And so get education first. Now, how do I actually get into it? A lot of different ways. For me, meditation has played a huge role. You hear meditation all the time. My meditation is maybe different than a lot of people because I just do seven minutes, right? I don't, I don't go into 20. My brain can't even handle an hour if it wanted to, but if I can get calm for seven minutes and it's just breathing, right? <sighs> breathing is your best way to get into the parasympathetic nervous system. Other than that, I love journaling. I'm a writer first, like by nature, probably like it's in my bones somehow, like I'm a writer first. And so if I can take all the craziness in my head, like the chaos of running multiple businesses of constant travel of, you know, podcasting all the time, and I can just write gives me space to think about other things, right? It gives me clarity. And then the other thing is, you know, just be mindful of what you're putting in your body. You know, again, as someone who was previously morbidly obese, I found food to be a great way to satiate. And I realized like when I'm really anxious, if I'm in that sympathetic nervous system, I will overeat, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or one of the things that I will do, and it's something I will hopefully not always battle, but it's something I do battle is I'm like, you know, I'm about to smash this bag of gummy bears, right? Mm -hmm. Now that'll only happen. I can count on both hands how many times I've had gummy bears in the last 10 years. But, you know, again, it's a, it's about that awareness. And so if I feel like I'm in that hypervigilant state, even before I'll eat, I'll just close my eyes and I'll breathe for 30 seconds, right? It's interesting. I cannot cite the research paper off the top of my head. I cannot remember. It's bookmarked on my other machine, but they found like prayer, like meditation before eating actually helped digestion. Mm. Why? Fascinating, right, Mike? But why? Because it's giving people the ability to step into the parasympathetic. We, we, We eat on our computers. We move 100 miles an hour. We never just take the space for the calm. 
And so, you know, even for me, it's always a challenge. And I think it will be a part of my daily practices to just find the calm. And, and one of my favorite meditative practices is I love to make a, my own espresso. So making my own coffee from scratch in the morning for that eight minutes that it takes me because I'm slow and I grind the beans and I get the water right and all that is like a beautiful meditation every day. So mm. find the thing that just brings you calm, that brings you peace and, and try that. Mm. That's cool. I, I really love that. Uh, that's a great, I'm glad I asked that question because you, you, you gave a great backstory and, and I, I put that in the notes here, the ACE score and, and checking out your podcast, the Think Unbroken podcast for that episode. So, uh, you know, listener, you can go get some more information around that and some great tools around um, just activating this parasympathetic I mean, making your own coffee. I, I like to make pancakes. So protein mm. pancakes, that's, uh, that's, you know, just calm and makes me get into that creative space in the kitchen. So, so I, I, I definitely I feel love that. cooking too. I'm right there with you. Yeah. Yeah, it's that. enjoyable. I don't know if it's good, but I, I enjoy it. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, this is uh, this is this is great. I want to I want to take uh, just a pivot before we head for the exits and and hear a little bit more about current day, like present day. You know, what are you up to now? You know, what have you done with all of these lessons you've learned from your past? Uh, you know, going from three hundred and fifty pound Michael to now not three hundred and fifty pound Michael to you know fifty thousand dollars in debt, Michael to now you know, running multiple businesses, best-selling author, the podcast, you know, can you kind of give us a frame of like, okay, where are you now? Where are you heading? Uh, like kind of give us that, that place of where you are now, where you're going. So people kind of can see, okay, if I'm somewhere in your journey of I'm dealing with trauma and I want to turn that into something where you are, or I've already overcome trauma and this is what I'm doing with it. Uh, I think it would be really helpful to kind of paint that picture for some people before we, uh, we head for the exits. Yeah, I think people ask me all the time, like, what does Think Unbroken mean? And it's really simple. It's like, transform your trauma into triumph. Like, that's it, man. And, and, and Mike, that's different for everybody. I don't know what it means for you. I don't know what it means for anyone else except for me, right? And, and for me, it's very simple. I always ask myself, did I do the thing I said I was going to do? Did I have integrity in my life? Did I follow through? Did I execute? That's it. You know, and, but, but that covers so many bases, man, about the food you eat, the people you spend time with, the books you read, the podcast you listen to, like everything. It's all, it's all encompassing. Did I do the thing? And so today it's, it's just continuing to do that and it's showing up every day and it's learning every day and, and it's sticking to my guns, right? I think one of the really difficult things people go through and what I went through, especially in the beginning of this journey was feeling like I had to bend myself to what other people expected of me. And, and it was really hard to recognize that sticking up for yourself is a sign that you are healing or healed. And so I apply that to everything. I'm like, if I say I'm going to do something, I try not to bend that right? It's funny because when I put together Unbroken Conference, I announced it within a week of thinking of it. And within that week, I had all of my speakers. I had the entire thing outlined. I had the entire website up. And within literally within seven days of the idea, it was in real life. It was in life. It mm -hmm. was happening. And I think that's the thing that I am at right now in my life is just continuing to make my dreams come true and to help people in the process in the future. How does someone you know, trust only, that by the way? Uh, how do you, how do you, how, do, how might someone, or how do you trust that? It's like you have an idea and then you actually follow suit on executing the idea. Some people, a paris, par, paralysis analysis, right? Settles in. It's yeah. like, they have to weigh it all out, but you trusted your intuition and acted on it. How do you do that? Because I've done it for so long. Hmm. And I'm willing to be wrong. I'm, I'm willing to be like 1,500 people registered. Nobody showed up. I'm willing to play that game. Because here, here's one of the things that Tom Bill, you taught me that I, I carry with me all the time is this idea about being the learner, right? He talks about that constantly. And what I realized in learning, which is really the, the crux of what failure is, I was like, oh, if I, if I screw up, it's fine. I learn something. Mike, most people are in analysis. I can't even say it. Analysis paralysis because they're afraid of the failure. Mm. They're terrified of the idea that it might not work. 
And I'm like, yeah, but you might do the greatest thing of all time. And so I'm, I'm willing to chase the success potential and the, the really in that space, the notion that it's okay to mess up Mm. because every dude, everybody sucks all the time. Like, dude, nobody is good at anything until they get good at it. And, and that's why I was willing to try, like, all right, I'll give you a great example, man. Like, I, I'm a great writer. I'm a terrible editor, right? And so <laughs> my first book, you go look at the reviews on Amazon, look, look at all the sites, really. They're all five-star reviews, except for a couple. And those couple that aren't five stars, they're like one star. Do you know why they're one star? Because the grammar isn't perfect. But Mike, if I wrote a book where the grammar had to be perfect, maybe it's not in my voice. Maybe it's not the impact that it's had for the over 10,000 people who have read it. Maybe it's whatever, right? And so that intuition comes back to this thing you're talking about stacking. I'm only able to build confidence in myself from continuing to do uncomfortable shit all the time. Hmm. And so if I don't do the uncomfortable stuff, I don't learn to trust myself. And if I don't learn to trust myself, I can't have confidence. If I don't have confidence, I won't be willing to take the bigger risks. Like there's a lot on the line for this conference, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially. Right. And it's like, okay, cool. Bet. Let's see what happens. Hmm. And it may be a huge disaster, but I have a feeling it's not going to be because I believe in myself because I've done all the hard, man, I've spoken on stages in front of 10,000 people at Grant Cardone's events. You know what I mean? Like that's a mind blowing, crazy thing that you can do. And I've spoken on stages in front of one people, one people, one person where nobody showed up, dude, where it was like seven years, six years ago, I'm hosting my first events and nobody's coming. Mm -hmm. And that's okay with me because I'm willing to, to figure out what happens. And so as you go through life, I think if you're willing to set aside the fear and just stand in potential, right? Most people are looking for reasons why they can't. I'm only ever looking for reasons why I can. Hmm. Can, can you tell, tell, tell us a little bit more? You got this conference coming up, 1,500 people registered. What is the outcome? Like, what is the promise of the conference? What is the problem you're solving with the conference? What is the potential outcome for you and for everyone that's attending it? Yeah. Look, at the end of the day, I think it's going to be different for everybody. I mean, we have amazing speakers. And the reason why I brought together a conference of amazing speakers, we got Anthony Trucks, Jamie Bronstein, Leslie Logan, Dan Mangia. Um, you may know Ben Curtis, the Dell guy. If you remember, Ben Ben is amazing human transforming lives all over the world right now. And, and also an interview we're doing with Dr. Gabor Mate, who's the leading expert on trauma. The reason why it's not just me and it's all of these amazing people is because, you know, I've really come to realize, Mike, in a moment, the voice that you need might be somebody else's. And so I said to myself, maybe I can bring all these people from all these different scopes, have all this level of education, and we can teach people in this massive event all these different ways that they can heal. I mean, dude, we even have Ken Honda coming on to talk about money trauma. Ken's one of the most successful businessmen in all of Japan. Mm. It's incredible. And he's coming to teach us about healing money trauma, how to heal our inner child. I'm going to teach people the framework and the baseline of science of, of trauma. We barely touched the, the broached it today, right? And we're going to go deep into it. And the outcome is whatever it is that you desire. Because here's what's fascinating about events like this. You know this. You go to online events. You go to in-person events. You're, you're a person who is in personal development. You will find whatever you're looking for. And so my, the only promise that I'm making people from my side is we're going all out. We're going hard. We're going to give and create as much value as humanly possible to teach you the same things that we have learned. An accumulation of hundreds of years of information over four days to give you the tools to transform your trauma into triumph. And that's the promise. Mm. Mm. That's beautiful, man. And and I, I love that. Um, I love that you're taking on the responsibility to offer this to people that you're taking, you know, as Tony taught me years ago is my mess is my message and that you're taking your mess, turn it into a message and helping a ton of other people do the same. So it's, uh, it's, it's really beautiful. And, Thank um, you, man. we, we ask, uh, we ask each guest, uh, you know, three questions before they leave. And then I'd like to know where they could find out more about you and more about the event. 
Uh, the first question is, what do you think the world needs most today? Empathy, man. Hmm. Like, you don't, it's crazy to me. Like, you know, I've traveled all over the world. I'm, I'm sitting here in the UK right now. And, you know, I just, I look at how sometimes people just need to like pause and just realize like, you do not know what's happening in somebody else's life, man. This thing's hard. Like, it ain't easy for any of us, man. We're all going through something. And so if we can just pause for a moment and just be chill with each other and make the world a very different place. That's good. And uh, second question, what are one to three books you think people should read? I think that arguably one of the most important books I've ever read is called Radical Acceptance by Tara Brock. I think it's massively, massively important. And, and it's really about being okay with who you are. Um, one to three, what comes to mind? Um, I, I'm an entrepreneur. So by nature, it's in my blood. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, I'll, I'll add a caveat here. If you're an entrepreneur, um, I think you could read anything Russell Brunson has ever written and find success in your life of some capacity. Um, and then I would add a two point a to that and add Alex Hermosi's book, $100 million offers, because it's unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Um, and then I would say the third book, just because we often get compared, which I think is funny because I've never broken any Guinness records, is uh, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Because, man, it's just powerful. We actually grew up about 15 minutes away from each other. So. When you were telling your story, I was thinking about it because I've been listening to his audiobook, and when he was going through like some of his experiences, like going to like the all white school and like some of the some of the things that you were sharing, I think there was definitely some some similarities and um, parallels to to the story. So uh, that's a, that's a fantastic audiobook on that one for sure. Um, so yeah, that's great. And my third question for you, Michael, is what does it mean to you to be better than rich? When you, I think about this all the time. My number one fear, actually, my only fear, it's my only fear. My only fear is I'll die with regret. That's it. And so, living a rich life to me is doing everything in my power to make sure that doesn't happen. Michael, this was fun, man. I, uh, it was lots of, lots of great nuggets of wisdom that came through this. And I know people can pick up the book, people can go to your podcast. We talked about that. I know this event is coming up. This is going to be released uh, probably the first week of December. If uh, someone wanted to you know, learn more about the event that's coming up next week, if they're listening to this, uh, where could they learn more about that, that, the conference? And also, where could they learn more about you or you know, continue to follow you, know, you on your journey? Yeah, man. Um, it's unbrokencon.com, U-N-B-R-O-K-E-N-C-O-N.com for the, for the conference. Um, and then I'm everywhere on social at Michael and Broken. And uh, man, Mike, this has been amazing. I can't believe this time just flew by so fast, man. You asked the best questions, dude. This was super fun. Yeah, well, I'm excited to you know you know continue the conversation and see what we can do and following you on social media and um, uh, I'm really excited to just uh, be a part of the journey as we can. So, uh, thank you for your time, Michael, uh, and uh, listener. Thank you for your time as well. And assuming this episode has helped you, uh, it's your turn to help others by sharing this with a friend. Subscribe on YouTube, leave a rating and review on Apple and Spotify, and remember, leave today better than you found it. Till next time. What's up, guys? Biggs here. I hope you enjoyed that clip. Uh, if you did, go ahead and check out the other video that's being recommended on the screen right now. You can also subscribe to our channel. And then if you really are interested in what we do, go to AutomateDelegateSystemize.com to learn more about what we're up to. Thanks again.